Hit record. And it broadcasts. The webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. Okay. So, uh, hello, Internet. Um, I imagine we're, we're doing this. This is, if you're watching this recorded, this was uh, a live uh, session that happened on uh, February, today's the 12th. Uh, and uh, so people are going to be sort of coming in here, and this is, you know, it's all been recorded, so you're, you're dealing with that. Um, my name is Nate Berkepeck. I run Speed Shop. It's a Ruby on Rails performance consultancy. I wrote the complete guide to Rails performance. And today I'm working with Josh Pickford. Uh, Josh has many hats that he wears. I think he's like basically a professional many hat wearer. Uh, but today we're looking at his app playlist, uh, which works with Spotify. And we're just going to talk about, going to need to know, what camera you using? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. That's the whole reason we're here. It's really to look at my camera, new camera setup. Um, but anyway, playlist, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through his app, and we're going to uh, do like a performance teardown, sort of like what I would do with clients um, anyway, but just do it live uh, and just do it together. So, uh, welcome, Josh. Thank you for doing this. Appreciate I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nate. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about my camera at the end. We'll, we'll get to, we'll stick with the important stuff first. Um, so Josh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about the app. Um, so what is it? What does it do? Um, I will bring up a screen share here, uh, while you're talking about it. Cool. So yeah, so playlist, uh, is essentially like a smart playlist builder for Spotify. So if you've used iTunes in the past, when you create smart playlists there where you set all these different rules, to basically pull a bunch of tracks together into a playlist. So um, the, the thing with Spotify is Spotify has these things called audio features with like weird things like danceability and mood and uh, tempo and stuff that you can uh, basically pull tracks based on. And, uh, and so this lets you build smart playlists around that plus a lot of other stuff. Um, now, from a functionality perspective, Essentially, we pull in all of your tracks from Spotify when you connect, and then we use that to build this sort of like master Spotify um, database of songs to pull from. Okay. So it means a lot of data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I have just been thrown for a loop because apparently my screen sharing will not work until I restart. Oh, wait. No, it looks good. Hold on. Let's try this. Okay. Yep. 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 That looks good. So sharing that monitor. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yep, that's fine. Okay, cool. And this monitor's dead. This is why I'm doing this. So I know exactly all the digital pieces that are completely fall apart as soon as I try to use anything. I this this camera setup that I have. I swear it's got a. Uh, like a physical piece of hardware you need to like let your Mac accept HDMI input. And to get it to work, I literally have to restart it and unplug the cables between two to 10 times. So when it starts working is just sort of like when it feels like it, which is, uh, is really great for a critical piece of equipment. Okay, so that is like, now my sidecar is just like totally exploded. All right, let's restart that. Disconnect. Let's just say we don't even need it. Um, so with playlist, the data comes from the oh, there it goes. The data comes from the music, not from really like a million users pounding the site, you know, every five minutes. So the like we we ingest all of your sort of your Spotify library. And then there's some, a few things that we do to like, we'll say, okay, now go get um, the top tracks from every artist that we have in the database, because then that'll go get additional tracks that may not be in people's libraries. And, um, and then there's other things like grab all of the top tracks from Spotify. Like there's these like sort of daily tasks that get run to try to expand our database of tracks that we can build a playlist from. Sure. Um, okay. Past that, we do, uh, I think every 30 minutes, it 
calls, uh, makes a call to the Spotify endpoints to get the songs that you've been streaming. So we use that to generate a, a play count of songs to say like, here are your most played songs um, and use that to make a, a playlist for instance. But that's, that's kind of how the data comes in and out. Okay. All right. So this is what the app looks like. Um, I'm not sure if I have a Spotify account to demo this. Oh yeah, I do. Okay. Agree. The, the kicker will be if you've um, got songs that you've liked in Spotify. Ooh, yeah, probably not. Okay, so that's that's your that's your uh, your what else, what's the word I'm looking for? Signal. Yes. Like I, you, you'll be able to, so what you could do is, um, under library, you can select from full Spotify catalog. Mm. That'll get you, that lets you pick stuff. So, mm. okay. Um, so you can still generate a playlist. Oh, and these are all the, um, what are the, what is Spotify call these things? Audio features. Are, audio so features. Probably half of those are, are Spotify feet or audio features. The rest are just kind of ones that we generate or, there's things like lyrics that we, we go and scrape lyrics to pull those in. Oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah. I like the uh, play count one. Uh, that reminds me of what was the, yeah, the, there was like some app that like gives you a Spotify song that's never been played before. Oh, really? Well, that's, a, I mean, that'd be, yeah, worth a, worth a try. <laughs> okay. And then limit, what would be, a, what, what will limits is there a default limit? I guess there must be. I, I think I've got Spotify in the right in the app. I think I limit it to 250. Spotify won't generate a playlist more than 5,000 songs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I just hit save playlist, wow, that was really quick actually. That was hella quick. That's awesome. Yeah, so all this data, do you already have all this? Yeah, that's our that's saved in the database. <laughs> so did you just like copy the many, whole Spotify catalog? <laughs> that's right. That's that's what I'm working on. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now it's, I'm starting to understand where this it's is. It's many, from. many gigabytes of data. <laughs> okay. And like the way the Spotify works is you've posted to Spotify now this playlist, right? And so this is in my That's right. So if yeah, so if you open Spotify, yeah. you know, it sends it to a sidekick worker to then go yeah, save yeah, yeah. it. Okay. All right. Wow, oh, this is quite, this is all over the place. Love yeah. it. Okay. All right. Cool. So let's um, dig in to uh, Skylight and let's, let's, let's see what we, what we see. The links for it are at the bottom of the, the readme file. I've lost your audio. There's something. And how about now? Oh, there we go. You're good. Yeah, it's it Zoom seems to be trying to change my mic constantly. So that's another thing I'll have to figure out. Uh so this is Josh's uh, GitHub, shpigford slash uh, plylst. And like he was saying, at the bottom of this readme, uh, we've got his uh, Skylight dashboard. So with any APM dashboard, the first thing that I do, and this is, I teach this in all my workshops, is all these tools, every single one, will try to show you the last 30 minutes by default. The last 30 minutes of data is almost never useful unless you are like Shopify scale where you get like a bajillion requests per second. What we really want to look at is a large body of requests. So, you know, I, I, if, 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 if I could like wave my wand and like get the exact interface I wanted, I would say, show me the last hundred thousand requests and then however much time that is and we just it would just figure that out uh but they all do this based on 30 minutes uh skylight's ui for dealing with this is at the bottom uh what i do on skylight is you know you can you can do live stats for the last six hours instead of the last you know 30 minutes 
What I do is I just zoom all the way out on Skylight's bottom tab here, and then just drag this all the way that, that it will let me to the left, which I believe is 24 hours, so I get the last 24 hours. This is one of my least favorite limitations of Skylight, is that, that the max amount of data it will show you in one view here is the last 24 hours. Uh, New Relic Scout will do a week on the cheap plans, and they'll do months on the more expensive plans. I really like that, especially for services that don't have that much request load because it gives me more requests to look at. Uh, so the way that Skylight organizes things, typical and problem. So typical is the median response time. Problem response is the 95th percentile. So typical, see 50th percentile, same thing as median. 95th percentile uh, is what they call problem. So for anyone watching who doesn't understand what percentiles are, the 50th percentile means that 50% of requests or responses are faster than this number. 50% are slower. That's the exact same thing statistically as the median, right? Not the same as the average, but the same as the median. 95th percentile is just like the median in another spot. So we've got 95% of requests are faster than this number, and 5% are slower than this number. Uh, both very useful numbers, uh, but we're going to use them for different purposes. And we've got the request right here, six requests per minute. So the actual web request load on this, very low. Uh, but I imagine if we click over to worker, we're going to see quite a bit different story. So 600 jobs per minute is a decent uh, sidekick load. Nothing like crazy like scale or anything, but sure. it's obviously way more than what we're doing on the website. So that tells us a lot already. We're going to be spending probably most of our time today looking at and working on uh, the worker backend. Yep. Um, the way that Skylight organizes your endpoints here, so each one of these is a controller and then a method on that controller. So play this controller edit, play this controller show, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, shows you what kind of response it is. Looks like you're doing almost, you're doing entirely HTML, right? That makes sense. Yep. So there's, no, yep. there's no JSON being uh, served here. Some of these are just redirects as well. And it will organize them by popularity, which is how much traffic it gets. And what it does here with the agony score is it's multiplying the popularity of the endpoint by how long it takes. So popularity times traffic equals agony. So any endpoint that has a low response time and low traffic will be low agony. So that's all the stuff down here. It's very quick, eight milliseconds, and like it barely gets. Well, this average is actually really popular, but here's here's eight milliseconds and it barely gets hit. So no agony. Uh, then, if either the response time is slow or the popularity is very high, we might get agony on that endpoint. So your highest agony endpoint is a very high traffic endpoint and has two seconds of response time. Uh, some of these also have just bad problem responses. So just looking at the web part right here, I am just going to automatically ignore anything that's faster than about 100 milliseconds. We're just not going to make that faster in a meaningful way, especially in two hours. It's really just not even you know worth looking at. Sure. The endpoints that I'm just going to get drawn at here are going to be playlist controller edit, playlist controller show, the OmniAuth callback, which we're probably not going to be able to do anything about because I'm guessing we're going to open that. Lost your audio again, Nate. How about, we go. How about this? Back. Yeah, let's keep it on this for now. Okay. This is good? Yep. Okay. All right. So... Really, the only controllers here that look interesting are going to be edit and the call, uh, not the callback, sorry, edit and show. Um, yep. The callback here, I'm just going to open it up so we can talk about it and not look at it ever again, uh, is going to be most, is going All to be these Spotify. two callbacks. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there's nothing you can do about that. So, like, we right. can just ignore it. Um, okay. So let's look at edit. And then after that, we will look at new. And then I'll look at show. OK, so this is editing playlists. What I do like about Skylight is they do this response time distribution. And you can highlight it. And then that'll change what's being shown down here on the summary. 
So if we want to look at only the really fast requests, we can just highlight that section and it'll show up down here. So most controller actions in, in, in any web application will look like this, where there's a bimodal distribution. You have a sort of like fast path and then a slow path. So the slow path is back here. These are all the requests in the histogram taking more than two seconds. These are the really fast ones. The really fast ones, so there's like 87 requ uh, requests being highlighted in this little chunk here. So 87 requests in the last 24 hours on this controller took between 93 and 387 milliseconds. What, what did those look like? What did they do? Well, they ran some code in the controller, ran two select, and then read from the cache. A cache read, actually a little slow. So that's interesting. Um, and that is one cache read. I'm just going to blow out the trace here. So this is, I'm turning off the condensing. So it's going to give me just the whole trace that it took, even the really uh, uh, fast parts. Yeah, so that is interesting. That is a fairly slow cache read. And it was a hit. So I'm going to keep paying attention to that. That might, that might be a sign in, if we see this again in other controllers of a cache configuration issue. Um, so maybe some problem with the network round trip time, maybe the cache itself is just slow and isn't configured correctly. Not enough to know just based on this, but other than that, there's really nothing else in here. And that's, that, that's our fast path. But we came here to fix the slow path. So let's, let's highlight and look at that section. 416 requests in this little chunk I'm gonna look at here, 2.8 second average response time, most of the time spent in the app and not in the database. When Skylight says this, what they mean is database time is time spent waiting on the database to return the result of a query. It doesn't mean time spent in active record. Those are two separate things and we might get into the, the weeds on that uh, if it becomes necessary later. So like you got some quick queries, you know, like select from users, you get the current user, that sort of thing. Nothing too bad there. And we're generating a cache and then writing to it. We've got a kind of chunky select here as well. So that's related to the cache as well. Like that's that genre call, which we can talk through what that is. If, if you want. Yeah. And let's look at Okay. And so here's the real problem. Three, <laughs> 3 million objects <laughs> allocated to generate this cache. And let's, let's, let's also see if we can get an idea of the hit rate here. So yeah, so this is not, something is also wrong here. So notice how the cache generate occurs in 100% of selected requests. The cache write occurs in 100% of selected requests. So every single request is hitting a cold cache. That is a hit rate of 0%. That is, that is not where we want cache. <laughs> That is, that is the opposite. Um, Fail. Yeah, so we've got a cache problem here. Um, so let's just dig into this. I think this will be a good example um, if we can figure out where this stuff can, is coming from. I can tell you where it is. Yeah, let's do that because it looks like so, Skylight will not provide a line number for me here. Yeah. Let's take a look. So this is, yeah, if you know where this is coming from, why don't you uh, walk us through? Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's in, um, I would start in the, uh, check the user model. Okay. That's gonna be my first guess. If it's not there, I can check the playlist model, but I think it's under the user model. So scroll to the bottom. There you go, the combined genres. Hmm. Bless our hearts. So, so uh, this is only gonna be called once, is that correct? So, okay, so that gets, the, but the playlist edit, the form for that calls that method to get the list of genres for to to build a playlist. Okay. So, but but the but the genres are associated with the artists, not tracks or anything like that. Yep. So, so there's two things that have to be done. We first we generate when you're um, initially when you sign up, and then periodically, uh, what your genres are. Like, you have these genres in your library of of Spotify songs. But then we augment that with the most popular genres across the entire library or, and the entirety of Spotify so that you can create Spotify playlists that are outside of the songs that you've liked. So maybe you're into like acid jazz, but like you don't have any of those songs saved in your library. So you, the only way that we can generate a playlist of acid jazz songs is to let you pick that genre from the popular list of genres. So. 
But there's, but Spotify has o almost 4,000 genres. So we, we, we can't show that full list in a select. So we say, let's pull the top X ones um, based on the number of times they happen, they exist in the artist. Your, your mic's dead again. And there we go. We're back. Yeah, we're going to go back to the, uh, hold on. we're going to go back to the MacBook Pro microphone because something is clearly knocking itself out. Okay. This is why I did this. <laughs> so everything could break. <laughs> Great. All right. So uh, the, let's walk through this then. So to get the combined genres of a user, Yep. We're going to first ask if the user has any genres. Which that's the, like the existence of the genres and the users is generated elsewhere and just saved as an array. Um, oh, I think so that's genres. A, wait a minute. Wait, so how no, so, are genres defined? Oh, so it's, it's, a, it's just a column on the user, but like oh. we create, we, we pre generate that basically in a background job. Oh, okay. And then just save it as an array. And okay, then it gets, okay. re it, gets, it gets updated once a day, just as you add more to your library. Oh, okay. So here's the pluck. Yes. Artists.pluck genres. Artists.genres from that's artists. That's where that's. So it's pulling, you know, there's whatever. I don't know um, how many artists are there. We've got. Almost 300,000 artists, each with a, an array of genres associated with their, their row. Okay. Okay. And it looks like the, huh. So I think, okay. So actually, this is kind of funny because I actually have a, um, I have a newsletter coming out on Monday about uh, caching. And this is kind of one of the common problems I see. So you've wrapped basically a what is right now a slow active record operation yep. in a cache uh, and the cache has an extremely low hit rate and uh, the isn't it does not make it anything any faster I mean if it, if it has a hit rate below 50 percent it literally can't make it any faster so yep. rather than I think the the you the path forward on these things is to get rid of the cache block and to make what's going on in here it's fast enough that we don't have to cache it anymore. Yeah. So let's take a look because I'm I'm definitely thinking there's ways we could we could make this a little bit more uh, performant. I mean the interest. Let's think about because the actual select artists from genres from artists itself is actually pretty quick. So that's going to be these this first part here. Artist.pluckgenres.reject. I'll blow this up. So, okay. So this part right here, artist.pluckgenres, takes 238 milliseconds and allocates 34 objects. So that's fine, actually. That's not, that's not too bad. What happens here on the dot .reject bang is we're converting this active record relation into an array. And then after this point, we're working on this as an array, okay? Once you do this, well, actually, pluck should have actually, I'm, I'm sorry, pluck returns an array in the first place. So that's actually not a problem. I was, usually sometimes we have problems here about when stuff gets converted into arrays, but the array that's being manipulated here over the course of this chain is what's causing this three, three million allocations. <laughs> So we're going to have to look at this and probably a big improvement here is just going to be using some destructive operations. So we're modifying the array in place. Cool. So Josh, do you have the ability to bring up a production rails console? I sure do. Yeah. Let's, let's get ready to do that because I'm going to basically look at this and then probably ask you to run it in the console and see what happens. Oops. I don't think that. Let's pop open Adam, and I'm just gonna look at this, and let's see what we can do. Why? 
Carlos Antonio says you can cache the popular genres separately. Yeah, I guess because they're the same for everybody. Yeah, because artist.plug genres is always going to be the same for That's a good idea. Yeah, because each user is recomputing the popular list to combine with his own list. That's a great idea, Carlos. So we should pay attention to what parts of this are user specific and what parts of this are not. Because clearly the problem right now is the cache key is based on the user. So users are only going into this once per session, once per 24 hours. Means we we can use it at all. Did my mic just drop? Did my mic just drop, Josh? Okay. So now my microphone is going all over the place. Something is uh, going on with that. All right. But global genres will change more frequently than user genres, says Benjamin Fleischer. Okay, we'll have to think about that too. Then, so how how often does the data change underneath? Okay. So I can get that syntax highlighting. Soft wrap this. Okay. Pop genres, yeah. So you're talking about this artist.plug genres part. That's interesting. We'll have to come back to that. Um Josh, can you screen share and just artist.plugGenres.first10, and let's just see what that data looks like. So we know what we're kind of like plugging into this equation here. Yep, so it says you'll have to stop sharing for me to start sharing. Okay. That's probably a setting I can change later. Okay. So let's just pluck the first 10 artist genres, or sorry, artist.plugGenres.first10. So that's still gonna give us the whole pluck, but we're just gonna see the first one. Okay, so it's it's an array of arrays. Okay, I didn't expect that. Okay, because I guess an artist, each artist is, is part of many genres. That's right. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. That's good to know. Great. So we've got an array of arrays coming in. Okay. Okay. And we're gonna reject any arrays that are empty. I see that, okay. And that's a reject bang, uh, so that's no problem. And then you're flattening it. Why are you flattening it? Because so you're, that just gives you a list of all genres then at that point, I, right? Yes, because then I need to count how many times those genres exist. Okay, can, can you give the screen share back to me while I'm editing this? Yep. Gracias, share. Okay, so we're gonna, Pluck that genre list, which Carlos uh, pointed out that that's probably a candidate for separate caching, which I like. And then we're going to reject any artist that has no genres. We're going to flatten that list, which then just gives us a list of all genres. And then we're going to group by itself. That's kind of cool. I've never seen that before. What does group by itself do? I think that would do the like, okay, if you've got 10 different pops, then it puts it back into an array of all the pop, I believe. I could be wrong. Why don't you uh, take the share back and run those first couple of lines? So if we okay. pluck, pluck genres dot first 10 dot reject empty dot flatten dot group by itself. So. Yeah, what does yeah. that look like? Okay. I will stop that. So that's what that does. But I mean, it's only 10, so you're not going to have more than, you know, one of them. Thing. Groups by itself. Oh. So like, I wonder. So why did you want to do that? Well, I think, so then I could count and associate, I could say like zap step has 
occurs 10 times. Oh, okay. So it's like, because they don't yeah. order by the, by the oh, map most popular. Oh, okay. Dot to H dot sort by, and you're, you want the 1000 most popular. That's right. Okay. But the only way I can do that is to get all of them from all artists. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. And wait, so uh, if we go back, so now that I've finally seen this whole thing, let's, um, can I take the share back? Yep. So let's go back to this. So why, well, why is user even in the cache? Mm. Right? Like there's nothing in right. here. Well, no, no. If you go to the next user. line, 46, I'm combining your, like I want to make sure that oh. your oh, genres are still your genres. Yeah. Your genres dot unique dot sort by down. Okay. So really it's this, just pop genres is not user specific. Correct. That, that should be cached on its own. That's right. Okay. So I think we're going to do that eventually. I think, we're gonna, as I'm looking through this, we're gonna find where the allocations are coming from. We're gonna, I think we still need to fix that because yep. uh, then the, the cold cache path, even if we even if we just cache pop genres separately, is still gonna have 3 million allocations, mm -hmm. which is not great. Uh, I'm seeing the chat light up, so I'm just gonna see what people are saying here. What are you all yelling at me? This is PG, you can do more than Mar Yeah, I was thinking about that too, Benjamin, like especially with pluck genres and then like trying to group here. Like I think probably we can do a little bit of that in SQL. Uh, I've never seen that before. Is genre not its own model? No, it isn't. It's an array uh, attribute. Is that correct, Josh? That's right. Yep. Group by itself is useful when the array has duplicate elements. It can get you a count. Yeah, right. That's what he's doing here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Barry, Paul, I agree. This this feels like a database operation up to on my screen, up to line. Oh, let me bang this out a little bit more. Dot reverse dot first one hundred. Dot map. Okay, I don't really understand what that last map. Yeah, yeah. I think all of this is probably a database operation. Uh, Barry, we're just going to figure out the right. Active record incantation, but grouping things and then uh, and then counting them is typically done in the database. Now, this is a Postgres array. Is that the exact data type, Josh? Um, let me check. I think it's just a text field, but um... because that's going to be a new one for me is figuring out how to group count, group by count with a Postgres array. Mm. So the genre. Well, okay, you're saying for the artist itself, their own array. Like it's, it's a JSON B. JSON B again. <laughs> our friend, but it's like, I'm looking at it here and it's like an array in a JSON B uh, column. Okay. So that's going to make things more complicated. All right. I'm going mean, to keep going through the chat. We'll come back to that. In the other, reality, there's no reason for it to be a JSON B. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That might end up being, a, well, I mean, even at the, I kind of like it as an array. I think maybe that's fine. Maybe like the array data type might be better. That's not the same thing as the JSON B and then the array in that, uh, but like the Postgres array data type. We might have to be digging through some Postgres docs here to see if there's a the, the right syntax for this. Although my chat and community consistently amazes me. And by the time I get to the last message in this chat, I, they will probably will have figured this out. <laughs> uh, one other note, the cat key is using self. Yep. Isn't that going to use user to S? Yeah, I was thinking about that, Carlos. There's a specific, um, that might have been, you know, Carlos, that's a great point because, so Carlos says, use you to ask, so it cache only for that user instance, the like actual instance of the user object, not reusing the per user cache on each request, e.g. if using self.id in the cache key instead. Uh, so all op active record objects and all objects in, uh, in general, uh, what Rails does is it calls a method, which I believe is just cache key on the object. So what Rails actually expects you to do in Rails cache is to just have a list of objects. So that would be Rails cache. I'm gonna bring this up. 
Rails cache, I think the way Rails expects you to do this is rails.cache.fetch some string, comma, the user object. And that now gives it as an argument. Rails will call user.cache key on the user, and then the user's responsibility is to say, okay, my cache key is this. It's more complicated than just the ID, which is what you proposed, Carlos. Uh, but it will, it's, it's saying the cache key for this is the user row with, you know, such and such identification. So yeah, that's probably something we're going to have to fix. Although eventually the cache key here, I think is probably just going to be pop genres. Like it's not going to be user specific, but yes, I think originally this was a, an incorrect usage of the cache key here. What we should have done was pass the entire user object. Uh, into cache.fetch, not put it into the string. Sounds like that group count ordered by popularity should be a SQL call. Yes. Feels like genre should be its own model. I don't know if I agree with that. Josh, how many genres are there? Total for about 4,000. Yeah, with a bridge table and maybe a counter cache. That, that feels like overkill. Like, I don't think the... Uh, any artist probably has more than a handful of genres associated with them. Is that correct? That's correct. And we still need to be able to pull artists by genre. Like, yeah, right, 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 right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. You want to look up all the artists that are pop artists or whatever. Right. Yeah. So I, I agree that an attribute feels better here. Uh, looks like a deal for SQL at dot lazy. Hmm. The cache key is a string interpolation. I posted this in the QA window. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Al. I need to also look at the QA window. Nice to see you, Al. Uh, and Kirill. Hi, Kirill. Uh, sorry, are you using combined genres self as a cache key? It's unique for every instance. Yes, you've all caught this now. Great. All right. Let's look at Q&A quick. Al, to use mutating array operations through the entire sequence of transformations, don't chain all the methods together. Yeah, yeah. So Al's brought up a point here. So like, let's see if I can copy and paste your answer here. So Al's brought up this point here where the return type of destructive methods is often different than the ret return type of the original. So dot reject returns an array of genres without the empty uh, ones. But dot reject bang returns the objects, which uh, I think it just returns nil actually, but all, the, all of the destructive array enumerable methods return different things than what the uh, non-destructive one returns. Map and map bang is like another one. Um, but they all return different stuff, so we can't chain them the way that we've been doing here. So yes, if we if we decide to to go that route of adding more destructive methods, um, we're going to have to fix that and and uh, not chain things the way we did here. So that's that's a great point, Al. Joel Taylor says, at what point would you consider modeling the deal differently? Seems like a more relation. Okay, so yeah, we brought that up before in the chat. I I'm not. Uh, I, 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 like I said, I, I'm not down that route yet. Um, I think it's a good, something you would always have to consider when looking at a problem like this, but I, I'm not quite there yet. The cache key uses string interpolation. Yep. Okay, great. So, oh, I've answered all these done. Yep. I answered that. Boom. Pow. Got it. Sick. Okay. Cleared my inbox. <laughs> all right. And one more person in the chat now that I'm all caught up. Genre stats could be a materialized view. Yeah, so that's kind of like materialized views feels to me like the nuclear option in this kind of scenario. Um, yeah, you, that's your next sentence, Benjamin. You don't do that until you feel pain, not until you get the query right. So yeah, that, that would be sort of the last thing on the list uh, would be a materialized view. I think we can probably solve this without materialized views. All right, so let's head back to this. Where are we got? So by itself. So yeah, let's think about this from a SQL perspective. So we've got, uh, as you said, Josh, and I'm going to bring up the um, the schema here just to verify and to show everyone what you just said. In the schema, this is the use. Oh, actually, we're looking at the artist table, aren't we? And we're looking at 
genres, which is a just JSON DB. Okay, which happens to always contain an array of arrays. All right. So what we want is a group by count with the JSON B. That is something else. I have never done that before. That will be new to me. I'm just gonna Google it. So JSON B uh, group by count. Let's see. Because if we can do this in the database, that is definitely gonna be one of those things that's gonna be faster. Oh, this is just somebody. Some bytes. What's his column? Yeah. Select. Yeah, that's not what I want. Uh, if anyone in the chat can figure that one out, that that'll be an interesting one because we have yeah, we distinct count of JSON B values column. Yeah, that's. That's always a great stack overflow answer when you start seeing people type cross join lateral. That's always really helpful. Um, I think unless someone gets this in the chat, I'm not going to be able to just Postgres wizard this one out. Databases are not my super strong point. Yeah, and it might involve converting it. I mean, I also think this is the kind of thing where, like, uh, you know, obviously we could, we might could make some of the call itself performant, but then like caching just the popular genres. That'll get us 90% of the way there, won't it? And like right. fixing, I mean, fixing the, the allocations, I think too, uh, will just probably get us 90% of the way there. So if someone wants to try that one in chat and get extra credit points, I will give that to you. But I think we can probably fix most of this by fixing allocations and then caching pop genres. Because this part will be really quick then. Because I imagine how many genres does a user have? Uh, I mean, it's probably under, I don't know, a few hundred. Yeah, because this is going to be real quick then. Yeah. That's going to be no problem. But the pop genres will be a thousand. Sort by down case. Okay. All right. Well, let's do this in order. Artist up pluck genres. That's fine. So that's the array of arrays. And we're going to reject all the empty ones. That's fine. That's, that's how it's, this is all, I haven't changed anything, right? This is all how it's written. Yeah. It's good. This is all how it's written today. I just changed the spacing. So we'll check. Yep. Okay. So we reject bang the empty ones. Flatten. Okay. Let's take a look at flattening. I mean, to, I think, create a new object in that case. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, there's a flatten bang. Okay. So flatten bang, flatten self in place returns nil if no modifications were made. The array contains no subarrays. So this is one of those things where this would break it. Uh, because let's see what the return type is. Flatten self in place. I mean, it's unlikely <laughs> based on the data here. But if, if, the, if the pop genres up to that point was ever empty, it would now, we'd now be changing the type of what was returned. So we could, we, we could leave this in place, but let's not. And I'm just gonna write it like this, real imperative like, so I can follow along here. And we can clean this up later. Okay, so that's good. So now we're, now we're doing that in place. So however many millions of objects this was, uh, we're now down to half of that. And let's think about this group by now, okay? Group by itself, because group by is gonna create a hash. So there's really nothing we can do about that. Group by itself and then we map I think maybe v dot count hmm, to h dot sort by v. Hmm. We can't really avoid creating the hash here, can we? Pop 
because we're on a rose dog group by itself. I mean, the map, because we're turning that back. Yeah, okay, so we've got hash into an array back into hash. So let's fix that. <laughs> uh, so we've got a hash here grouped by itself. And you want the count instead. Okay. So, oh, chat is lighting up. Let's just double check to make sure no one has to totally fixed my idiocy. Okay, you're all working on the yeah, sort by last without the hash conversion, it's just a 2D array. Josh mentioned being able to look up artists by genre. Genre.findname pop artist feels natural back. We're talking about the data model still. Genre stats can materialize. Okay. Dot tally. Uh, what uh, Rails version are we on, Josh? We're on 5.4, right? Oh, it's, oh, it's in. Ruby 2.7, okay. Yeah, we're on Ruby 2.6 here, so we don't have tally today. That's an interesting idea. Let's look that up. I've never actually used that method before. Uh, I'm not gonna have it in uh, the, I'm not gonna have it in RI, so I'm gonna look it up online. That's pretty cool. Enumerable tally. So this would have come out in 2.7 in December. Tallies the collection. Counts the occurrences of each element. Returns a hash with the elements of the collection. Yeah, that's actually exactly what we want, right? I mean, can you see this, Josh? Like, like you're just taking the, the flattened array and then you get the result back as like, you know, here's how many times each one of these things happened, right? That's exactly it, isn't it? I mean, we could just say I'll upgrade to Ruby 2.7 and call it a day. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, look, this is all in C as well. So that's, that's going to be way faster than whatever I, I could write in Ruby. I, look, let's, let's say this. Let's say I will, like, tally sounds like the best solution here. Uh, at the very least, let's just uh, cache the pop genres because then it, I mean, that takes away a ton of stuff. Um, and then... I'll upgrade 2.7 to use tally, and then that probably completely solves that whole issue. Okay, so dot, wait, and then dot first, dot thousand, dot map, dot first. Is, oh, you, you want just the keys. I just want the, yes, because I'm just, okay, I'm using let's just use dot select. keys then. Oops. Okay. Yeah. And then, so pluck genres, and then you'll cache this part. You know, I'm not, whatever, cache that the right way. I'm just yep. marking this. And then you'll do this yourself. And let's make this a sort by bang. And then I think you're good. So I, some of this is, I, I'm not sure what the return type is here. So I'm not 100% certain on the correctness here. So you're going to have to figure that out. Uh, but I'm going to hold on to this. So we'll, we'll hang on to this. This is our fix for user.rb. Yeah, and I think that'll improve things by quite a lot. You know, yeah. like like we were saying in the chat, you know, I think the perfect solution here is to do this all in SQL and then just not cache it at all. But uh, with the JSON B, you know, complication here, that's that's messing things up a bit. Cool. That was fun. That was a fun little problem. Okay. Um, how long have I been going here? An hour. Great. Let's look at Q and A. Come back. The Q and A window is gone. Okay. So I have something like this to count: pop genres dot each with object hash new. Can you see that uh, Q and A window, Josh? Or do I? Okay. Have... okay. Uh, hash new zero. Yeah, that's. I, I think that works, Carlos. Uh, I think tally is just. The easiest option here. This Josh's app is really simple um, and and quite new. It's not a lot of code in it, so upgrading to two point seven for him isn't a big deal. Yep. We can omit reject empty, since Flatten will already ignore empty arrays. Oh shit! I didn't know that. That's cool. So if Sunny's right, we can get rid of this reject. Nice. Cool. And good catch, Sonny. Okay, uh, let's look at some other actions. What else we got? 
So that was uh, playlist controller edit. That's clearly the only problem here. Everything else looks fine. Yeah. And let's look at the slow stuff on playlist controller new. Oh, same thing. Cool. I love finding. There's, this is a pretty common thing where you have like a particular method on a on a model which slows multiple places in the app where it's called. So we've got the same problem here, exact same pattern. So that'll fix that as well. And playlist controller show looks a little bit different. So it looks like we've got an N plus one here. Although usually when there is an N plus one, Skylight will mark it as such. It, can, it has this little icon. So probably these, these are a little bit different each time. Yep. So these are pretty complicated and they're a little bit different probably every time. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm assuming it's just breaking them up but based on like, what somebody's, those are all different playlists for people, presumably. So this is playlist show. We get the tracks. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting here too is, oh. So look at this, this distribution. It's like a long, just one single mode. But if you look at each of these items, you'll see they occur in less than 1% of selected requests. So somebody is getting a really bad N plus one here, but not everyone. Do you have like an admin view or something? Uh, I mean, it's just like direct access to the to Postgres. I mean, I can huh. see like what, what somebody's settings I, are. Huh. Yeah, this is a... Interesting. Like each of those is like somebody has added, you know, five different rules for a playlist. And then this is the. Oh, and they're showing up to Skylight as different as queries, aren't they? Because they're different. Right. But oh, I think each that's of those lines, they're, that's not like one request. Yeah. So what would be cool, and this is one thing Skylight doesn't do, is uh, New Relic to some extent and Scout to a lot, what they'll do is allow you to look at traces of one person's request. So we're seeing the aggregate view here, right? Scout and New Relic will let you look at what happened on one person's request, and you would probably see that pattern where it's like, oh, this person gets this query, and then someone else gets this one. Right. I think probably, I mean, the way forward here is going to be to look at each of these queries sort of individually and say, well, pop this into explain, analyze, and then say, yeah. well, what's going on here? Probably. So I think like, I mean, all of this stuff is almost like hyper optimization of like indexes and stuff, um, which I've done and that's helped a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we've probably got some that are like, there's a couple of playlists where some weird combo of, of rules has like made for a really slow request for some people. Um, I, my hunch is like some of, given time constraints, I guess, yep, to tackle sure. some of the stuff in the workers. Let's do that. And probably looks like some of this is going to come back to JSON B columns again, is what I'm seeing, right. like some of these stuff in here. So that's probably where that's going to, that discussion is going to go. Yeah. All right, let's look at workers. So what's your, what's your number one concern here, Josh? Um, a lot of these just take a long time. I mean, like, I think what I've, you know, if, once we start digging into any of these, some of that stuff's going to be like Spotify taking for freaking ever to return a response. Um, mm -hmm. And then others, it's just, I'm guessing I've got some like poorly optimized way of saving the data. Mm -hmm. or, okay. or at least like processing all the data that Spotify gives me. Um, so, I mean, I'm fine with sort of like if we wanted to start at the most, the highest agony thing and then yeah, yeah. see if that gives us some stuff. Um, What's it? Why do you have an error queue? So Is that like a retry queue? That would probably be the retry stuff because Spotify's API errors very regularly. <laughs> and so um, half of my like Spotify retries are just like, I mean, uh, sidekick retries <laughs> are just Spotify like breaking in the middle of me pulling the data. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're at traditionally the... But you, you have a queue named error, that's correct? Or is that, is that the way that it shows up as retries here? I don't, that must be the retry. Or like there, if there's an actual error response that forces Sidekick to retry it, I don't have an error. Yeah, that's, that's, probably, that's probably what it is. Um, 
This is Sidekick, right? Yeah. Okay. And this is, we're looking at, I was looking at Process Tracks Worker. Let's uh, see what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, this is just going to get thrown into a default queue because you didn't say anything else here. Right. Okay, yeah, so it must have been, that must mean this is already aired. Okay. The typically, the like, the ones that really probably cause the most issues. Uh... Why is this select so slow? Okay, so audio features worker. I think this there's might be some low hanging fruit in this. Okay. Uh, and if you're just coming to the stream, all of this stuff that I'm looking at, along with the code, uh, is available to you as well at shpigford slash playlist on uh, GitHub. So at the very bottom is a link to uh, Skylight here. So yes, that top one. Okay. Oh boy. So my guess is there's some low hanging fruit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah. So begin, that means we're starting a transaction and these queries themselves are taking quite a long time. How often is this job run? 500. Uh, it's not very often. So the way that this, this is what I, I have to make a separate API call to get the audio features for a track. So I try to patch <laughs> Well, those. we shot ourselves in the foot with this one. <laughs> That's a great given message. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, face palm emojis. Um, <laughs> so, so what I do is I bulk these, and I think I can call like up to 100 at a time. And so I make that call to the audio features endpoint and then process those. Oh, let's undo. Hmm. Hmm. I'm a little confused here because the uh, repeated multiple times icon, you know, the N plus one icon is showing up here, but I'm not actually seeing where that query is actually ever run ever again. So I'm a little confused by why it thinks that this was being run multiple times. So. Um, let me think here. So, hmm. yeah, I'm trying to think if I, what would have, what would cause that? Well, if I just step through this here, so we don't have line numbers, but this code is pretty simple, so we can step through. So, tracks dot where Spotify ID track IDs. So that's this query. So that's quick. We don't have to worry about that. There's a quick. Spotify get, which I guess is probably this, our Spotify.audio features, right? Correct. Yep, yep, okay. So now we're going to Spotify tracks, which is the result of this, dot each, okay. So this is like what, JSON at this point, at line 12? That's right, and there would be at most- oh, it's a hash, it, it was uh, JSON. Well, it was, but then, it, and then it, it's like maybe up to 100 items, though it's got nested stuff in there, but. Okay, track equals tracks dot, Fine. So I'm, I'm trying to match up the Spotify, the return oh. from the Spotify audio features with an existing track row. Yeah, and I think we're still okay here because that just, should just use the enumerable method. I'm okay with this so far. And then we update that track's attributes with all this other stuff. Huh. So where's all these queries coming from? This looks pretty yeah. straightforward to me. Track instantiation, select from tracks. Select the track from tracks where Spotify ID in. Oh, track, track. So, oh, uh, wait, track with Spotify IDs pluck. Oh, maybe we're not. Huh. Is the find actually making another database call? Yeah, maybe, because I think this, at this point, this is uh, still gonna be an active record relation. Uh, yeah. We're not actually gonna run the query yet. So the query hasn't been run until we get to here. 
So we're actually calling dot find on an active record relation. So that might be. I mean, that would explain the. That would explain this query, but it's not very. It's not like it's slow or anything. So I'm not super worried about it. But what's what's the? Oh, this is this is the update. So what we're really really out of fix is that be, we see the begin and then the. Oh, sometimes it rolls back. So this is the begin commit. This is the update attributes yeah. thing that's happening here, right? So what is going on? Whoops, with these. Select albums from albums where album ID equals limit something. Select I don't even artists. Know I mean, is this a callback? I'm trying to think of I mean, all of these are, are just column names. This is that this is an exists check here. You're asking if a track exists with certain things. This feels like a update. Here's the actual update. I mean, those those definitely feel like. Uh, let's take a look. That that feels like a callback to me. Uh, like a. Uh, oh, on the track. Val validate Spotify ID uniqueness. Oh, that's fine. What? No, it doesn't look like you have any. <laughs> you don't have anything to find. So that's not it. Why? Spotify track. Oh. What is the track, Spotify track? Are some of these, maybe some of these attributes are not just straight attributes here? So like, do they, just some of these? All, no, there are every single one of those is just a, a column in the database. Then why are we getting an artist? I mean, um, also, so, what's weird about these is like, they're just really, Slow, so it makes me wonder how many artists we're getting here. So, like, we're seeing the bind parameter. We don't know from this data how many of artists you're looking up or how many albums you're looking up. Right. Uh, but it, it's very slow. So you would hope it would be quite a few. Um. Track. Yeah, because there's nothing else that's happening here. It's the only place they can come from is we've, we've determined that a track has no callbacks. So it's not those. Dependent destroy. I mean, so you have like a <laughs> callback? No, OK. Uh, uh, Validates, that's not gonna it's Spotify ID. Yeah, that's fine there. Oh, so there's okay, so this is interesting. So this I think, yeah, so this is the uniqueness check. Select question mark as one from tracks where tracks.spotify ID equals and tracks.id is not equal. Why is that so slow? Is that, you said that's on the track of the- Like the other I, thing that's, that's kind of like shifty here is like, look at how all of these SQL uh, calls are exactly the same size. Right. I mean, in the case of, um, let's see. So the tracks, the tracks, uh, table has like just shy of five million rows. It's got, I don't know. I think I think you've got a configuration issue here. With what specifically? Or or I, mean, like, it, it, I, guess, you know, I think where you were going with that was like it could be that, that it's the size of the tables here, right? Yeah, that I mean, was yeah. How, how much, what were you, can, can you complete your oh, sentence there? Like when I yeah, came like, off, what, 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 what were you going to say? So size wise, yes, yeah. so almost 5 million rows. And then like, I think like 10 to 12 gigabytes of indexes. Um, but I mean, that's on the track table specifically, but it feels weird that it would be that slow. Why don't, um, 
Why don't you try this? So can you open up a database console? Yep. Um, so if we just run this, and I think what we can do is just like, if you can maybe use the console to find a row here that we can use um, in tracks. So find a row in the tracks table, and then we'll get whatever that Spotify ID is, you know, whatever that, and then the, whatever the ID is, limit one. So you can run a query like this. Yeah. Let's see. And let's see how fast that is. Because if it's six seconds, then we found our problem. Right. Thanks for uh, watching, Andrew. There's more. I'm still working on the JMD in the chat. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it took it took a hundred milliseconds. Hmm. Uh, what what was the ID that you used for tracks? That ID? Yeah. And there's one. Did we to pick a different one? Uh, yeah. Try try like the last row in the table because that's gonna matter. The okay. the because the sort of the index is gonna come into play here. Yeah. Uh, it was even faster. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, cool. So it's not that. All right. Is it possible that Skylight is just wrong? Mm, probably not. Not this consistently. Yeah. I mean, for 367 jobs. The other thing, sometimes what happens in background jobs is what people do is like, with background jobs is certain job types come in in batches. So they'll get like 30,000 of a particular job type. And then 30,000 jobs are coming through and pounding sidekick and like all hitting the same tables and trying to do the same thing. And that sort of like creates this unexpected database load, which then shows up as all queries slowing down. Yep. But this isn't at that kind of scale. So I'm not worried about that. Um, but this stuff in the tables is big. Like the tables themselves are big. So I, I, I think I'm going to start saying I'm pretty confident that this is something going on from the database perspective, not in the Ruby code. Yeah. Because everything here looks six seconds, six seconds, six seconds, six seconds. Maybe yeah. one thing we should take a look at here is the sidekick configuration and make sure that we have enough database connections in the database pool. That could be what's happening here. Uh, yeah. is we're starving out our database connections. So let's take a look at how you configured it. Oops, well, that's too far back. So to figure out how your database is configured with Sidekick, uh, let's take a look at uh, where does, uh, so Josh is using render, is that what that's called? This yeah, render. So where, where do you define like where, how Sidekick is started? Like where, where that command line? Yeah, so that's, you know, typically you do it like a proc file or something. It's got separate. No, oh, so serious. like. Is that's, this, is this how that's, it's run in prod? No, so it's right. like there's separate um, instances where like I have for like just a given queue, I have like an mm -hmm. own, its own separate instance of that. And it, so I, I just, the command line just fires off the like what specific queues I need to be running um, or instance. Oh, I see. So like the, each one of those like is a, using a different right. So it's like I I tell the start Ooh. command will be like, you know, bundle execute sidekick and then like pass in what specific sidekick config. So how is the slow? I guess we're in the slow queue. That's so a slow who's, queue. Who's pulling from the slow queue and what's their sidekick? That would be that's the default one. one. Okay, this one. Yeah. So you just have some queues and max retries. Okay, so there's no setting here for concurrency and there's no setting here uh, for anything else. So that means you're gonna be running with the def So that's that's literally the command line. It's just bundle exec sidekick config sidekick default. Let's, let's double check that. That's correct. Yeah, look, okay. looking at the menu. 
Okay, so that means we're running with a concurrency of 10. That's uh, the default. And oh, you don't have uh, the Rails max threads I, environment variable set, do you? I have it Rails set. Rails max uh, threads. That one is set. Yeah, I have oh, a it like a, and it's set to 40. Oh, okay. I think I got the problem. All right. So if you don't set sidekicks concurrency explicitly, it uses Rails max threads. Uh, you set Rails max threads to 40 specifically for. Uh, that's like a, that's a, for anything that would use Rails max threads. So Puma too? I mean, if, if it's, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what I'm asking is, is like, is this set differently for oh. different, what Heroku calls dynos, but like, is this set differently right. anywhere else? Or is it just everything that you're running has Rails max threads 40 in the environment variables? That's it. Okay, shit. All right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So this, <laughs> yeah, all right. This is going to cause problems. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, okay. So then that's the concurrency side of the equation. Um, I'm going to come back to the website later. Uh, let's focus on workers for now. Uh, in database.yaml, what is your pool set to? It is set to nothing? It's not set anywhere. So that means it's going to be five. Oh, there it is, okay. default. OK. So do you have any either of these set? Oh, so what is this DB pool set? Now where did you, oh, um, let me see if I have DB. This is actually not mm. that bad. I do not have DB pool set anywhere. Oh, OK. All right, so at least it's so set it's, them to the same value. So in theory, you should have 40 database connections for 40 threads. That's actually fine. Uh, 40 threads is still too many, and it's still possible uh, something different could be happening here, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, let's think about this. So Rails max threads. 40, DB pool is not set, you said. So that means we're gonna be running with a pool of 40, okay. Prepared statements false, are you using PG bouncer? I'm not. Hmm. Why is that in there? I think that's a default thing, like. Oh, is it? Yeah. Connection pooling, what is that? What are you what are you pulling? This is this is what I'm trying to get at here is I think we might have a mismatch between how many threads are running or how many sidekick threads in total are running and how many database connections they're allowed to use. Right. That would show up as database connections taking a really long time. So okay. yeah, when I saw that prepared statements false, that's usually a sign that someone's trying to use uh, the some kind of uh, connection pooler, PG bouncer. I may have this may have been like but this was initially on Heroku, and so this may have been like a holdover from me just trying to fix a bunch of connection stuff, hmm. and not sure ultimately like where it came from. Uh, what would be an easy way for you to figure out if you were using PG Bouncer? I mean, I have personally render. never set it up. Oh, okay. So <laughs> You're pretty confident I'm, on that? I'm confident that that is not something, unless render does something okay. by itself. But it In the long run, then one thing you could do is to just turn prepared statements back on. There's no reason to have it off at this point. Okay. Um, let's see the comma. Um, and DB pool is not set. Okay, all right. So we should be running with 40 connections in the pool. Hmm. And uh, do you know for your database plan if you have some kind of connection limit? Let me check. That it, if you were hitting the connection limit, I would probably expect that it would error some errors harder. about that. Yeah, yeah. right. But uh, um, let's just check. I'm not aware of specific connection limits. Yeah, they, they do exist. I mean, I mean they, they exist, have... obviously, but I don't know what hmm. OK. Six seconds. Yeah, the fact that it's always exactly six seconds is uh, it's pretty shifty.
And it's always six seconds also across multiple tables. So it's not like, you know, artists or albums has a lot of, well, it probably be tracks that has the most data. Like we would, if it was, if this was based on the size of the data, we'd expect some of these queries one to be longer than the other, but they're all exactly six seconds. Even the commit and the begin, which really are making me think that there's something going on here with configuration. Two hundred sixty-seven jobs processed. So these don't really, and it's in the slow. Hmm. Yeah, while you're looking for that, I'm gonna just take a quick look at some of the workers and yeah, no, that's not that slow. Okay, so there are other workers in the slow queue which get decent SQL performance. It's just. This one, that's in the default queue. So it tracks me. So I was kind of just checking there to see if it was maybe just this instance type that had a particular problem, but this instance type is actually fine. Hmm. Yeah, this is, this is good stuff. Where's, do these all come in at the same time or when does this worker get run? Um, let's see, it's, it gets, so it gets run every 30 minutes on all tracks that either um, the audio features are blank or, um, or they haven't been checked. I think it's like 72 hours or something. Like I don't keep checking it because it's possible so Spotify doesn't have it. But It's just one of these that's being run every time? So no, so it's like, so what gets called is there's a process audio features worker that then, oh. um, that then goes and checks all the tracks to see what even need, what is missing audio features mm -hmm. based on how long it's been since it was last checked or if it's empty. And then it fires off audio features worker with up to a hundred, or I guess it's 90 actually, 90 different track IDs to bulk check. Hmm. So you could have, I mean, it would, it would be probably tens or hundreds you know, of thousands of audio tracks. Okay, okay, you know what it is? This is like what you were asking me about earlier. If Skylight was lying to us here, I think it is. So I think actually what it's trying to show us is that this is looped. So I think, and it's really confusing that, that they show it this way because no actual profiler would show it to you this way. I think what's happening here is if you look at this code, right? Like this is the loop here, line 12. So let's say something in here causes like five SQL queries, right? Yeah. You do that a million times, which is what you just said. You know, this is gonna, that loop is gonna execute how many times in here? How many, what Spotify track size? Oh, it would be up to 90, it looks like. 90? Yeah. All right, well, that's, but I'm saying that's like it's, it's those I was are, hoping those to hear things. more. <laughs> no, it's like, because we have to batch it. Otherwise, we'll get a, a rate limit error from Spotify. Oh, so, oh. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if it's, because like the, I, I mentioned this originally, right? Like it's, this is showing up, this query is repeated multiple times. Yeah. But it, was, it doesn't actually show up anywhere else in the trace. Right. So I think it's, 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 it's accounting for the loop by showing us one bar. Right, like like each time we, we run through the loop, it's adding on to this bar a little bit. That's not how a real profiler locally would show this, which is why it's really confusing to me. Uh, two point, where did my calculator go? Oh, here we go. Okay, so 2.9 seconds. 
Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, that means that each database query is about 30 milliseconds, which is more reasonable. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's still a little slow, but that's more making more sense. So then in that case, if, if that's true, then we got to go back to the original hypothesis here that something in here is actually causing queries and causing specifically these ones. So Which are you saying it could be the, the, the validation. So what I would do, Josh here would be uh, to run this job locally or in production even because this is just a it's a you know, you could run this a million times on the same data and it'd be fine, right? Because you're just updating the same data and over and over. Yeah. What I would do would be to run this again locally, probably, with good, some data, you know, correctly populated. And what I would do would be uh, to make sure that when I ran it, that the active record based logger was set to something I could read. So like standard out. So now to make sure that like just log all the queries that are happening, right? Yep. And then in Rails 5.2, you have access to something called the verbose query log. Have you ever seen this before? Oops. I don't know that I have. So, uh, do you know Olivier McCann? If anybody's watching the stream knows Olivier. Olivier made this pull request. Olivier is very active in the uh, cop circuit. Um, so we're gonna set this to true. And you can also set this in your config, right? So like, I might just do this in a console and then run it. And what's cool about verbose query logs is it actually shows you what line the query comes from. So if you run this locally with for both query logs on, don't do this in product, don't turn that on in production because it'll slow everything down too much. But you know, if you have the right data in, in development mode, it'll do the same thing, right? So yeah. get the right data in, run this job in a console with uh, that stuff on, and just see where the queries come from. I think that's really a, a, the best solution at this point. So we can't figure it out just by trying to follow the code. It was sure. not uncommon with this kind of problem. Yeah. And figure out where that's coming from and then make it not do that. You know, sure. do all the N plus one fixes that we know how to do, like includes and preloads and all that. Probably maybe you have to rewrite the method. I'm guessing it's got to be these attributes in here. Something is not doing what we expect it to do. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I think the six seconds is just how it's showing, which is honestly that confusing. Because your your config all sounds fine. Let's let's go back really quick and talk about Rails Max threads. Because uh, I did react to that. And I need to explain why. So that's a sidekick concurrency setting of forty. So forty threads. Okay. Um. And you said that's set everywhere. So let's take a look at how you're starting. You're using Puma, I think, right? Yep. <laughs> no. Um, and you're running Puma with Rails Max threads, threads. Okay, so 40 threads. I think you're not seeing this as an issue yet because the traffic on this app is not super high. Right. The problem here is all 40 of those threads share one. Ruby VM. So Josh, I've probably heard of uh, this. Maybe? Mm -hmm. I have not. No? Oh, cool. So my viewers have probably heard me rant about this before if they've come from my, my newsletter. So uh, it used to be called the Guild, now it's called the GVL. That stands for Global VM Lock. All that means is each Ruby process. So every Puma child worker, okay? So every Puma worker being like these things, the workers that you defined here. 
Every Puma worker has its own Ruby VM. Every Ruby process has its own Ruby VM. Every sidekick process has its own Ruby VM, okay? And all 40, all threads share that Ruby, all threads in the process share that Ruby VM. So processes have many threads. In your case, you have web concurrency number of processes uh, for Puma. This is Puma. And those have uh, 40 threads each, because that's what you configured it to. And Sidekick, you'll have one process with 40 threads. So number of processes equals the number of Ruby VMs that we have. Each process has its own Ruby VM. Processes have their own Ruby VMs. The Ruby VM is what we need to run Ruby. So you can just imagine it as like the machine that actually runs Ruby in the process. Right. Only one thread can have control of that Ruby VM at a time. That is why it is called the global VM block. Only one thread gets to hold that at a time. This is why people say Ruby is single thread. It's not like that you could, you could just list down that way because only one thread gets to run Ruby. Only, only one thread anywhere in this process is running Ruby at a time. So with 40 threads sharing one global VM lock, here's what can happen. Thread one grabs GBL, okay? So it starts running Ruby code. Then it stops. Usually a reason a thread gives up the GBL is, uh, it can, well, if it's done, if it's done running Ruby code, we'll give it up. But a primary reason is that thread run, thread one starts IO. So I, we need the Ruby VM to run Ruby code. We don't need it to wait or buffer IO operations. So checking Redis to see if there's a new job is an IO operation. Uh, you know, going to the database is an IO operation. So thread one starts an IO operation and then thread one releases the GBL, okay? So now thread two, which was waiting very patiently, grabs the GBL, okay? And starts running Ruby. Now in the meantime, thread one's IO operation has completed. It's done, it's, it's, the database is, has returned its result and we're all good. But thread two still has the GBL, okay? So there's the problem. Now thread one is waiting for the GBL. Whereas if you were running single threaded, it would have been fine and you could have been done by now, okay? So it's possible for us to set the thread count too high for us to add so many threads that we, the GVL is completely used and there's threads waiting on the GVL all the time and that will slow things down. It increases latency. Does that make sense? It makes sense um, to throw something into the curve here. So the way that render has this, like those sidekick processes are separate instances. Like I've got basically three, almost three separate apps running. That's fine. Yep. So, so you got, um, sorry. So you're trying to tell me you have three instances of sidekick app, running? Well, two instances of the sidekick and then one of the Rails app. Okay. So for each instance, that's like a box, right? Like a server. Right. Okay. So on each box, you have one sidekick process. Right. Which has one Ruby VM and 40 threads. That's right. So yeah. it doesn't change the picture. Okay. I just didn't know if those would like, you know, it's like you've got two different sidekick and they're somehow no. sharing. So like we can't share memory between processes. Each process has its own memory location. If we could, if we could just read other processes' memory willy nilly, that would not be great. Or especially write to it. But we can't write to other processes' memory because, like, that would be insane. We would just like, you know, hack. It. Like, you would download apps. They would just like hack, you know, Zoom right. by changing its memory or whatever. Okay, so we can't do that. Uh, so they, each process has its own process has its own Ruby VM, which has forty threads. So what I'm trying to get at here is that Ruby VM can become oversaturated with threads because they're all trying to use the same one. Now, in practice, uh, Sidekick's default 
is 10 threads. If you just set nothing, it just runs with 10 threads. That seems to be fine. The Puma default is five. That also seems to be fine. So ideally, I think you'd set Rails max threads to 10 on your Sidekick instances and to five on Puma. You can set it to five on both. I think it'd probably be fine. Uh, I'm not so worried about Puma because there's just not that much load going on it right now. Uh, but it's possible, this was kind of what I was getting at with Sidekick. It's possible that if you're running many jobs at one time on this process, mm -hmm. that the GVL is getting saturated and that that'll show up as IO looking like it takes longer here. Yeah. Right. I think you can kind of follow how that would happen based on this, this, this scenario I ran through. So it looks thread one's IO is completed from the C perspective, but the Ruby part of it won't finish. And then it looks like it takes longer. Right. So I, I, I think you should dial that stuff back. Um, yeah. I mean, and the, I guess the reason to even increase it was just, there's a freaking crap ton of, background jobs to run and so yeah. trying yeah. to get through them faster yeah i at this point you need to add more processes okay um, How, like, whether, whether or not just, you want to where would that like what would be the thing to scale up from a like an infrastructure standpoint uh Is well that, like, you, need, you can either run with sidekick you can either run more uh just add more instances so like it doesn't matter where what box they're on um, yeah. Like if you just want to just copy paste and add more instances, that's fine. Um, or you can add, if it's cheaper, you can make each instance bigger and put more processes on it. So like literally just change your proc file. Uh, I forget the syntax for this, but like you put multiple, you know, processes with, with, uh, in a proc file, like with one, okay. uh, process type. Yeah. Um, sidekick, you know, if you want to get, uh, well, for people that are watching that maybe either have Psychic Enterprise or like want to pay Mike more money to get this. Um, he has a, oh, is that, oh, is that in Pro? Oh, maybe it's in Pro, which is actually a lot cheaper. Uh, just put that in. Oh, I, I, so I don't know if this is in Pro or in Enterprise, but he has something called Swarm. What that does is it, it's a, it's a master process that manages running multiple sidekick processes for you. It'll make it use less memory because it uses copy on write the same way Puma does. Uh, and you can run more process, sidekick processes per box. So if you have pro or enterprise, go look for sidekick swarm. Uh, but Josh doesn't have that for his, for his project. Yeah. But there's, there's a million ways to start multiple processes and, and manage those, you know, so whatever process, whatever, you know, thing you use that, that works for you. That's fine. Okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, Josh. Is there anything else you wanted me to look at? Specifically, or you want me to just keep looking at background jobs? I don't know that anything specific. Okay, let's look at some of these other slow ones. Remove tracks. A lot of those are going to be um, Spotify. Yeah. So why is it, I've noticed you have a kind of a pattern with a get and then a post, I guess. Um, so in this case, I, I'm pulling information from Spotify and then I have to, I'm updating. Um, I don't know. In this case, let me see what happens. It may, the post might be um, getting an updated token for the user. So like, there, you have to refresh the user token for OAuth pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens is our Spotify, the gym, that library automatically handles when a token expires. So it could be, the, the post part could be, they realize, oh, this token needs to be refreshed. Hmm. Throw that in there. How often does that have to be refreshed? I mean, it's like, I think every hour at least. Hmm. I don't know about that because this is saying it's running 100% of the time and this is being run almost a thousand times an hour. Well, so if, if, it, if it's being done on every account. Oh, right. That, that user's Spotify token. Right. Because it's, it's specific to that user's Got it. authorization okay. of their Spotify. So 
And that's why it's like it's calling the accounts.spotify endpoint is it's refreshing the token. Okay. Yeah. Which there's there's like nothing. Not, there's one, nothing. Yeah. yeah. One thing I, I, I usually look for in external APIs is any opportunity to parallelize the IO. So like one thing I was talking about oh, right. with threads there is like they can run IO at the same time. So if you have like 10 gets in a row, there's ways that we can make sure all those gets get sent at the same time. Uh, but that's, I mean, if you need to get data and then process it somehow and then post something else back, there's no way we can parallelize that operation. So. Right. And that is most of this here is whatever that's going on with that. Yeah, and like, I'm just confused because like, look at this, right? So select users from users by that ID limit. Like this is like, this is looking up one user. I can just find the code here, right? It's right here. And yep. this, how many users do you have? Oh, it's like 6,000 or something. A couple it's, thousand, it's, okay. Yeah. So like this, this should not take 110 milliseconds, right? Like yeah. until you have like a million users, you know, like this is not that slow. So, and the fact that there's just not that many allocations in this job, 15,000, and it still takes a second is making me feel like this might be a, like this would be the kind of thing I would expect to see if there was GVL contention. There were too many threads trying to do this thing at the same time. Right. So it's possible that if you dial that down, basically all this stuff looks like it gets really fast. Uh, but we'll see. Because there's nothing in this trace that tells me, oh yeah, like this is obvious why this thing takes one second, right? That's right. obvious. Other than these gets maybe. But the, there's too much Ruby in here and it's not actually doing anything. So, yeah. and that, that database query being slow. So again, that, that's, that's pointing me back to the thread configuration. being a little bit too aggressive. Same pro same pattern here, like exactly the same pattern recently streamed. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have the same pattern in almost every job with all this stuff. 600 per minute. So you have 600 jobs per minute on so one the process, right? Uh, no, there's two, there's two, there's two types of sidekick processes, isn't there? Yeah. There's like a critical, which is like the user is waiting for this to happen in the UI. So it needs to be take top priority. That's a separate queue. And then there's yeah. like default and slow. Yeah. So here's, yeah, I think this is what's happening. I think this is what's happening. I don't really have time to like go into capacity planning in the last five sure. minutes. Cause it usually takes me an hour to explain. But yep. um, there's something which, uh, you know, I'll just throw this out here for anybody um, else to go Google this for themselves later. It's called an Erlang. Uh, it's actually a unit. So like Erlang the guy uh, who, who we named the language after uh, came up with a way of analyzing telephone traffic. And um, I teach how to use this to, to figure out how you need to scale uh, systems. And one of the things that he figured out was that if you multiply how long it takes to do something uh, by how often that work is coming in, you actually get a number that tells you how many pieces of work you are processing on average. So if I multiply 656 jobs per minute, oops, I'm just gonna start up a new thing, 656 jobs a minute, and I have each one takes I'm going to call it 600 milliseconds. So I'm going to convert these two things to be the same unit so that they cancel out. So 656 jobs per minute. Oops, I need to divide, not multiply. 656 jobs per minute is 11 jobs per second. And each one takes 0 0.6 seconds per job. So like I got jobs per second and seconds per job. So if I multiply those two together, like middle school science here, the, the units cross out, right? Our, our units are, are canceled. So 11 
times 0 0.6. Oops, 11 times 0 0.6. You, you're processing 6.6 .6 jobs at any given time. So over the course of 24 hours, if I just like looked at your servers, you're trying to process 6.6 .6 jobs in parallel at any given time. But from what you told me, you're doing that with two sidekick processes. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And 80 threads in total because there's 40 threads in each, in each process. But the, the problem isn't the threads, it's that each sidekick process only has one Ruby VM. So you're trying to process with one, two Ruby VMs. So you've got 6.6 .6 jobs, so three jobs per Ruby VM. What happens if, the, if all three of those jobs need to run Ruby at the same time, you know? So that feels to me like a problem here. So I would take the thread countdown, and if you see your, uh, your queues start to back up, mm -hmm. you need to add processes. So in the long run, you're probably going to need four to six, is going to be my guess to keep the queue size down based on these numbers. Uh, but that is probably the more sane config here. And that's going to get you a better latency on all these. Now, at the end of the day, uh, I, I'll send you some more of the stuff in my newsletter on this, but okay. job latency is like maybe not the thing you actually want to optimize for. Sure. Um, does it really matter if a job right. takes five seconds or one second? Yeah. I don't know. Capacity and, and throughput and how much it costs you to run those jobs is sometimes more important for, for this kind of thing. So if you try this, that this config I've just outlined here, and it's like, oh, like everything looks way faster, and like, uh, but it's costing me three times as much, and the queues are the same as they were before, you can no. go back to the old one. It's, right. not, it's not the end of the world. You just need to know that, you know, when you go look at your perf metrics, like, yeah, these are all kind of blown out because half of this time is spent waiting for the global VM lock. Uh, and that makes it look like everything takes longer than it actually does. I've actually had clients go that way before, you know, like sure. if it doesn't matter to you whether a job takes one second or five seconds, then yes, you should try to get as much juice as possible out of every single you know, sidekick process. Cool. All right. Anything else, Josh? Otherwise I'll wrap it up. No, man. I think that's good. That's been super helpful. Cool. I think uh, overall, I think what we looked at today is you have literally one problem on the website, which is that one <laughs> method that we looked at. So that was fun. Uh, and we, 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 we popped open a little solution to that that I'll, I'll send over. I think that'll be great. And on the worker side, there's no particular issue. And I think it is just this config, which then you can mess around with and sort of decide, you know, what is best for you. But sure. I, I don't think there's any particular problems in here. And then that, that one job that we're looking at, I forgot the name of it already, which, which sidekick. The, the six second thing on every single. Yeah, which, which actually is probably a loop. Um, right. So uh, you, can go, you can go double check my work with that by using uh, verbose query logs. Okay. Cool. All right. Cool. Hi, man. Yeah, dude. I appreciate fun. you doing that. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Let's just take, yeah, I appreciate it. All right, man. All right. Have a good one. Yeah. Talk to you later. Thanks to everyone for watching. I will be posting this later on Twitter slash YouTube and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, get that video for everybody if you want to watch it again or if you missed part of it. So check my Twitter for that. And uh, I guess while I'm sitting here, I'll just take, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yep. I said so I could concur and see as someone cash pool size. Yep. Okay, great. And let's check Q and A. Ah, my Q and A doesn't show up very well. I'm going to like go back to the zoom window, I'm learning things. This is from a while back. All right, Bazaar is clear to the fact that, yeah, that's okay. That makes sense. Thanks, Sonny. Yeah, so it's the it's the validation. That's what I thought. I just wasn't I wasn't looking very closely at the lines there. Good catch. Good catch. All right.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for dealing with my AV issues. That was part of why I did this stream was so that I could deal with AV issues that uh, are going to come up during my upcoming Rails Performance Workshop. Um, but I uh, appreciate you all coming and watching. And uh, speedshop.co, if you've never seen my stuff before, you can uh, take a look there. Sign up for my newsletter or uh, Twitter at Nate Berkopec, B-E-R-K-O-P-E-C. All right. Thanks. I am, uh, I'm headed out. Thanks for watching.